So we come to the last bit of our conference of today, which is the round table on Ukrainian fascists and the Bandera lobby, warmongers for the Third World War. I give a warm welcome to Arnold Schölzel. Russ Balland, uh, we already met this morning on stage. Welcome to you again here for our round table, dear Russ. And from London is the journalist Lurk Kronauer and your author. And hello, Jörg, warm welcome. And Oleg Jasinski, we will have a video. So I hand over to your Hoot, Editor-in-Chief of Junge Welt, to this round table. This so hello working. and good evening to everybody. It's not translating. The yeah, yeah, but this... For the end of no, this that one is over here. day... Yeah, I, I, I... No, but I'm saying the translation this it's is about for the translation. Sorry, th we have a mix of sound. I'm sorry. Sagt mal Bescheid. We have a mix of uh, sound which currently doesn't really work in the booth. My, my translation, translation isn't device working. Doesn't work. I, I hope this will work now. No. Maybe can someone help us? The interpreting does not work. Channel one. It should be channel one. Uh, okay. Hello, hello, channel one. Okay. This is the English channel. Test, test, test. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, now it apparently works. I'm sorry, thank you. So. We're ready. Okay. <laughs> so the fascism uh, uh, promoted by Kiev goes far beyond the uh, borders. This was already topic in different presentations. I think it was uh, astonishing when this week on uh, prime time there was a feature in the second uh, German TV which showed a uh, mercenary which went back to Taiwan in order to uh, train uh, militia members of militias. Uh, this was uh, shown in a rather positive way and was about uh, uh, building up front against the People's Republic of China. So it is now that the Azov Battalion uh, has uh, missionaries in the whole world, in Germany. And they came here, even in Israel, they've been uh, present and latest uh, with the case of Jaroslav Hunka in the Canadian Parliament in Toronto some weeks ago. It was already a topic here. It is a topic, Ukraine, Ukrainian fascism, which goes far beyond the borders of the country and uh, it creates a terrible political effect. So why is that so? This is what we're going to deal with in this round table. We want to see the role of the Ukrainian fascists and their allies as a motor and catalyst of conflicts, also beyond the Ukraine war. In this context, we should discuss political and ideological consequences, historical revisionism, suppression and stigmatization of opposition people and hate propaganda in the media uniformation of the public opinion. This will be the topics. First of all, I want to again present the guests here, Arnold Schoetzel, many of you know him, twice present with the Black Channel, like every week, and uh, in the newspaper he has a double page article on Bandera and the activities after 45. Warm welcome, Arnold. And our guest from the U.S., I want to present again for those who maybe haven't been switched on in the morning, Russ Belland. He's from Detroit, born in Detroit, worked as a freelance author on different uh, forms of U.S. American fascism and Nazism in the U.S. He was doing yes. research on that. He's committed uh, in solidarity groups against U.S. interventions in other countries. 
He published several books, among others, 1988, a very important book with the old Nazis, uh, the New Right and the Republican Party, published in German also, uh, Domestic fascistic, Fascist Networks and the Influence on the U.S. and uh, on the influence on the religious right, on the politics in his country, and some time ago, together with the start of the fascist uh, putsch in Ukraine, uh, seven decades of Nazi collaboration, America's dirty little Ukraine secret, uh, published in 2014. Warm welcome, Ross Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Many young world readers uh, here know him, connect with us from London, where he lives, uh, Jörg Kronauer, journalist and author. He's working on many different topics, on domestic and uh, foreign topics, but also on geopolitical, international politics, relationships, conflicts all around the globe. He published not only in Junge Welt, he's also co-founder of the internet uh, portal German Foreign Policy. So warm welcome, Jörg, I hope you can hear us. Who, who, someone we can't see, but uh, we will hear him, Alek Jasinski, from Kiev, born in Kiev. Ukrainian Chilean uh, journalist, uh, independent uh, independent media like La Prensa in Latin America, Infomonos, and a researcher on indigenous and social movements in Latin America. He produced political documentaries, uh, a series of books, uh, known as a translator of important works by Eduardo Galeano, Jose Saramago, and Subcomandante Marcos, which he translated into Russian. He's a columnist for the Spanish page of Russia Today and correspondent for Telesur in Russia. We will hear him in a second. So maybe applause and we hear his video. It will be read by Jürgen Lloyd in German. Dear friends, dear comrades, um, first of all, I would like to thank you for the invitation to participate in this conference and express my respect for the true Germany, for the anti-fascist, anti-militarist, Nazi-rejecting, humanist Germany. Despite censorship, bans, and persecution, despite unprecedented manipulation in the media and social networks, there are still people in all countries who have kept their common sense, their, their critical perception of reality, and above all, their personal need to fight for change. Thank you for your courage and humanity. And now to our topics and issues. I think that the influence of Ukrainian fascists on the world and even on Ukrainian politics should not be seen as a cause, but as a consequence of a process. Fascism is a state of consciousness constructed by the system and its media. Fascism is a very contagious and hard to cure disease of the human brain, but by itself, it is not capable of creating historical projects that are stable in time. It seems to me that the main problem lies elsewhere, in the extraordinary convenient usability of fascism as an instrument of power by multinational corporations for the purpose of maintaining control over societies. Just as Azov fascists and other structures pervaded by Nazi ideology are now in control of the Ukrainian armed forces, so neoliberal governments 
which are essentially the managers of global corporations and speculative capital, are creating local national fascisms to protect their own global interests. So it is not fascism that influences the Ukrainian colonial political project, but the Ukrainian colonial project creates fascism to control society. Fascism means the destruction of culture, ethics, class consciousness, and critical thinking. That means it means comprehensive neglect. A real fascist is usually unable to realize that he's a fascist because he understands absolutely nothing about history and is unable to reflect on his own. As before in other countries, the role of Ukrainian fascism is limited and concrete. It distracts the population from the main causes of its problems and turns citizens into Philistines, guardians of the established order, ready at any time to serve as cannon fodder for the protection, for the protection of the interests of the dominant. Today's neoliberal power cannot control its subordinate countries without fascism. It has run out long ago of rational arguments and intriguing promises. What remains are media shows, the industry of terror and brute force. To defeat fascism, it is necessary to understand how its psychological and media mechanisms work. It is necessary to know and understand how the system works against us, why it has proved so effective in brainwashing people on all continents, while left forces have been transformed either into mutual hostile sects or into corporate mercenaries under leftist slogans and banners. This is one of the reasons why fascism became possible in Ukraine. So what is the concrete and practical problem with fascism in Ukraine? It controls the apparatus of power. It keeps the civil power structures in a state of fear. It seems so that Zelensky is more afraid of his own patriots, in quotation marks, than of the Russian military. And the fascists are directly cooperating with Western agents, and on their direct orders, they can take out a Ukrainian function at any moment, accusing him of, in quotation marks, betrayal of national interests. Yes, this is a major initial problem for the possibility of peace process. From the beginning of the 2014 coup, it was clear that the most organized and politicized part of the demonstrators were the far-right organizations, right sector and Svoboda. They were small in numbers, but they made up for it with their organization and their clear political project, while the leftists struggled with each other for the right to call themselves the vanguard and argued about Trotsky and Stalin. It is very difficult to speak about the present influence of fascism and the Bandera ideology on the Ukrainian population because there is no serious uh, sociological surveys which are absolutely impossible under the given present circumstances. I remember the last month before the war when I was in Kiev and so I judge on the basis of my personal impressions. I'm completely convinced that the vast majority of Ukrainians do not, despite the great influence of the Ukrainian media over the last nine years, do not share fascist ideas. Even in Bandera's homeland, Western Ukraine, 
his supporters were always in minority. They simply intimidated the others. And many who knew their brutality and high level of organization were simply afraid to confront them. Today, the overwhelming majority of Ukrainians are deprived of the elementary opportunity to express their opinions. People risk prison terms for a statement or a like on social media. Today, it is life-threatening to criticize the Zelensky government and call for peace in Ukraine. The overwhelming majority of Ukrainians, regardless of their political views and attitude towards Russia, want this war to end as soon as possible. But everything is still decided by a self-interested, insane and aggressive minority that controls society with the help of Western agents and local Nazis. In today's Ukraine, it has long been pointless to speak of political opposition. It, re it remains were destroyed in the Odessa Trade House, in Odessa Trade Union House on um, May 2 of 2014, when dozens of people were burnt alive and beaten to death while the authorities remained completely inactive. The political field of today's Ukraine is a completely scorched earth where there's not only no space for opposition, but also for any critical thought that would touch the roots of the current tragedy. People who are dangerous to the government have either been killed or in prison, in underground, in the so-called inner exile, or, if they were lucky, have left the country. But even outside Ukraine, many avoid criticizing the government in order not to put close relatives in danger who have remained in the country. Unfortunately, they know very well who they are dealing with. And yes, there are those who have given up, who have been intimidated. I do not blame these people. They too are victims of this terrible machinery that will never stop on its own. That is why it is so important that we all stop it together. The Ukrainian people itself is the first victim of fascism, which I cannot call Ukrainian, because fascism has no homeland. Every fascism is always anti-Ukrainian, anti-Russian and anti-German at the same time. In these minutes and seconds, people are dying on fronts that should never have existed. To end the Ukrainian tragedy and save Europe from the same fate, the criminal, anti-Ukrainian and anti-human Kiev regime must be destroyed. The Ukrainian people, occupied by NATO and dragged into a fratricidal massacre by Zelensky's puppet regime, needs peace. This requires the solidarity of all the people in the world and of all the anti-fascist and anti-imperialist forces of Europe. And this struggle of Europe against fascism has just begun. I thank you all very much. Thank you very much. Oleg Yasinski. Two ideas. Let me pick up on two of the things. Fascism as an instrument for political purposes of the huge capital to keep control over society, but also to subjugate uh, states and then the brainwashing of peoples on all continents that is brought about by fostering fascist movements while other opinions are oppressed also by violence. Ross Belland, your entire political life, you have been fighting brainwashing. Let us take a journey back to the 80s. Back in the 80s, well, we mm -hmm. had uh, 
a conversation over the weekend where you remind us of those uh, discussions. What was uh, the societal atmosphere, the Cold War in the U.S. in the 80s? What was the political climate when those fascists came out of uh, the digs, uh, especially under the Reagan administration? Well, uh, in the post-Vietnam era in, in the 1970s, there was still strong anti-war sentiment, uh, even up to the year 2000, uh, when half a million people mobilized against invasion of I Iraq and the Bush administration invaded anyways. Uh, but uh, in, uh, then we were f fighting against the... Uh, uh, invasions of Iraq, uh, or Nicaragua, excuse me, and uh, Contras, and there was a uh, strong networking movement in solidarity with the people of Nicaragua, and uh, and we we were successful in getting Congress to pay attention enough. We had enough power and enough voices to ban the CIA operations in Nicaragua. Now. Of course, the CIA doesn't say, oh, oh they don't get, get up and walk away. We know that. But there were a, it, it limited their, some of their operational capabilities. We, can't do, we don't have that power today to stop this in Ukraine. Uh, uh, in the, in, in just, in pr just prior to the era, just prior to Reagan, and uh, during it, we had uh, the U.S. Justice Department uh, th thanks to congressional action, had created uh, and a unit in the uh, U.S. government to investigate Nazi war criminals in the United States, belatedly, <laughs> very belatedly. Uh, but they started uh, expelling the Valerian Trifas and uh, uh, Demonux and many others. Um, that it, we had um, also... Uh, investigations going on in the U.S. Congress about CIA abuses at home and abroad, the assassination programs, the uh, the uh, uh, invasions of uh, privacy and so forth. That that was the world that existed in the 70s and the 80s, and. Um, and the CIA reacted to that in, in very uh, covert and dis disguised names through various political movements that, inter that they were connected to, the neoconservatives and so forth. And uh, eventually, you didn't have the same investigative nature. You didn't have newspapers anymore that would publish the Pentagon Papers to e expose the war that would investigate CIA programs, um, that would publish re positive reviews of books from former CIA personnel that exposed the CIA operations. You don't see that happening anymore in this country, in the United States. Uh, and so uh, it, it seemed like there was an evolution of a, a new level of control where the the free press that wasn't tolerated in uh, Santiago or uh, uh, you know Guatemala or many other parts of the world now that uh, it, it, you know it, it, to take an example the uh, uh, a senior CIA officer once bragged that uh, their control of the press in Latin America it, it, it was all a house organ for the CIA they started to look at the American press, I think, as a problem for their operations. And I think there's an exertion of control that didn't exist decades ago. And, uh, and today, uh, we, can't, we can't even get coverage of uh, things that were taken for granted in the 1970s in the press in the United States. It's become much more restrictive and um, oppressive, and they're, they're willing to uh, attack progressives in ways that they didn't before.
über die Reagan Zeit sprechen, in der sie politisch sehr aktiv waren. Talking about the Reagan period where you were highly active. This was a wild anti-communist activity on a government level. You mentioned Latin America, the interventions in various countries, especially in those countries. That was uh, the object matter of one of your books. There were intense contacts between governments under the Reagan administration. They flourished under fascist groups. Old Nazis, there was a continuity. Back, dating back even before 1945, mm -hmm. uh, they went into exile in Northern America and then in Canada. And they had influence on the government policies. How can we imagine this? Could you wrap it up, uh, this uh, influence on a government level, which was the object uh, matter of your investigations? What was the organizational makeup? Uh, the organizational makeup of the, uh, the new forces? Yes. yes. Um, well, we had uh, 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 Ronald Reagan's predecessor, of course, was Jimmy Carter. Uh, and Jimmy Carter did not support some of the, uh, in Latin America, some of the repressive regimes. He pulled aid away from the Guatemalan uh, death squad government. He stopped aid to some, the Somoza regime and so forth. And so these instrumentalities that we talked about in our talk today, the American Security Council, the World Anti-Communist League, became active in mobilizing people against uh, the Carter administration because it wasn't supporting the repressive apparatus in the way that they were accustomed to. And so, uh, again, the Reagan administration went further than uh, the Richard Nixon administration and the Eisenhower administration uh, by uh, making the World Anti-Communist League more active and activist in mobilizing world forces to bring warfare in country after country that the uh, Reagan administration targeted, starting with Nicaragua, but also uh, Mozambique and Angola. Uh, working with the, uh, against the frontline states that were under the control of the South African apartheid regime. And they're very conscious. The uh, apartheid regime organized annual receptions of American right-wing organizations to come in and get tours of, uh, uh, of what they were doing in their system and how, how they were operating, and they were fighting these fights against the African National Congress and the uh, and the frontline states again, you know, uh, Namibia and Angola and so forth, and uh, Mozambique. Uh, once the Ian Re Smith regime was overthrown in Rhodesia, uh, and so they they became very proactive in terms of trying to engage a larger portion of the population to become an activist part in these foreign policy right-wing movements that didn't ex that didn't exist so much in the 50s they were active they were active in trying to convince the american population but now they were actively interviewing operating as uh, as uh, agents in a gr in a more grassroots level to gain c maintain support for the regimes when the they were under fire in the world press and the American press and uh, with the progressive forces. So Reagan, Reagan administration brought a new level of broadening the activism beyond the State Department and the CIA into right-wing political groups. The immediate influence of fascists back in those years, uh, you met uh, Stetsko, um, the wife of uh, Stepan Bandera's um, uh, successor. What was, was is your memory? It was not Slava Stetsko, but a number of other outstanding fascists. What uh, do you remember of those uh, outstanding fascists? Well, oh. <laughs> um, the, uh, uh, yes, I, I met Slava Stetsko, Yaroslav Stetsko's wife who was the representative of the anti-Bolshevik bloc of nations, the ABN, at the Wackel conferences. And we didn't have a long discussion, but um, she, I was introduced to other members of their delegation, and I had sit-down discussions with a number of them. Uh, that, uh, and some were interested in talking to me after the Wackel conference, and 
I went to New York City to meet some of them and have, have, have discussions, and that's where I learned more about their operations. And uh, some were very frank with me about their, their interactive role with the U.S., uh, with the CIA pri primarily, in uh, doing operations inside Ukraine, uh, covert operations inside Ukraine in the early 1980s. Uh, uh, in, in the Soviet era, and they, they, th these are operations they were doing through connected to Radio Free Europe and uh, signaling and uh, then doing measurements of reactions to various things that had been broadcast through Radio Free Europe. And, um, you know, th in the process, they had people going in and out of the country, and they developed uh, means to do that without being detected. So these came out of conversations I had with them. Uh, they, uh, I, I already described a, a little bit about the Nicholas Nazarenko uh, experience. He was the Cossack guy uh, who carried around his suitcase of, of, of propaganda and hate, hateful propaganda. And he, uh, you know, we sat, I mean, we sat for seven hours. He drank vodka the whole time and just opened up more and more and tell, telling me all the stuff about his uh, uh, Nazi connections. Um, uh, so, I mean, he, he was proud of it, where others were mu kept their mouths shut, and one of them refused to let me take his picture. Uh, well, there's a photographer working with me, and I tried to get his picture taken, and he, uh, he started getting very angry and threatening about it, and so... The photographer backed off, uh, despite my request that he continue. <laughs> um, and we, the uh, some wanted to talk because they were proud of who they were and what they've done, and some wanted to keep their mouth shut because they didn't want anybody to know the uh, what they did, what their history was, and uh, but. Over the several years I was meeting with them, both in the Republican Party meetings as well as the World Anti-Communist meetings uh, and some other side meetings, uh, they, uh, th they were universally unrepentant for any of their history. They never saw anything wrong with anything they ever did. The Roosevelt was wrong. The United States was wrong. The USSR was just the way they thought about it in the 1930s and the 1940s. Nothing changed. And uh, for all the mass murder and the devastation they brought to Europe, they were ready to do it again. Thank you, Ross. We will switch over to London. Jörg, I hope you can hear us well. Perfect. Yeah, okay. Until uh, the case of Jaroslav Hunke, we knew a lot about uh, the rat line uh, with the help of uh, the Vatican, the infiltration of Nazi criminals to Latin America. With Hunke, well, suddenly we became aware of huge crowds of SS people to Canada and the USA. What was the reaction in uh, the UK? Because the UK s served as a sort of uh, intermediate stopover because many of those who escaped uh, to uh, North America and uh, South America had a, a call in the UK. Well, well apart from the left, uh, there was little focus on uh, this phenomenon, but uh, the facts uh, are known, uh, not without contradictory statements. After 1945, uh, well, there was a rather right-leaning Ukrainian exile immediately after 45, uh, dozens of thousands uh, of Ukrainians, also you and people, that the Waffen SS members had arrived here. Well, this uh, came rather in bumps. In May 1945, they were fortunate enough, uh, they happened to be in Austria, to regroup. 
when the liberation occurred at the end of the war, then uh, they uh, they uh, capitulated, they rendered, uh, they surrendered to the British forces in May 1945 from uh, later what was to become uh, Yugoslavia. Uh, many Ustashis uh, fled to the Brits. The Brits however, rejected the Ustashis. They did not accept them as prisoners of war. So many of them, thousands, uh, tens of thousands, uh, perished uh, either in uh, fights uh, or in uh, very quick sentences or were executed without trial. Uh, that was how the Br Brits uh, dealt with Croatian fascists. They accepted, however, Ukrainian fascists as prisoners of war. Also for the reason that the Soviet Union, from a British perspective, was very different from Yugoslavia. Just by magnitude of power, Yugoslavia had an intermediate status between Western capitalism and the Soviet Union. Therefore, uh, towards Yugoslavia, the, the uh, British were more generous. The, 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 well, the British prisoners of, of war were not handed over to the Soviet Union because uh, they claimed that they had lived in Poland. Poland uh, was exactly this region that Moss described as Galicia. So the supposed war was that the Poles could never be rendered to Soviet Union. First, they were put into a prisoner camp in Italy, close to Rimini. They didn't want to take them into Britain. Only once Italy had uh, signed the peace treaty of 1947, well, and the matter of the prisoners of war had to be settled once and for all. Great Britain then decided, well, let them get here, not without frictions. The prisoners of war of the Waffen SS Division, Galicia, it was quite a concern to bring them over. Well, they were integrated into a program when uh, laborers from Europe were recruited, due the, uh, Britain had so many fatalities and dead. So the Waffen SS were a welcome workforce. Uh, 8,500, uh, a huge number. The government tried to belittle this uh, topic because it was not very popular to bring a huge group of people from the former enemy of war into the one's own country. Many of them continued their travel to Canada or into the US. So the British government uh, accepted this with a friendly eye just to get rid of them and to not uh, keep them in uh, the own country and also to prevent any unrest uh, but uh, they were protected against Soviet Union. Uh, and they were also protected against any uh, action or judicial action. So that uh, cannot be denied. Also against the backdrop that the Soviet Union was the huge opponent in the Cold War. So you, they wanted to keep this huge potential of potential opponents of Soviet Union. Sergei, on the 23rd of September, uh, delivered his last speech in front of the UN. He addressed a chapter or strategic plan that is not very well known. He explicitly for the Operation Unthinkable. With the help of SS and R, other Nazi veterans, a mobilization was planned for the f decisive uh, strike against Soviet Union. Some of these documents have been uh, released and declassified, yes, uh, since the end of the 90s. Yes, it was a plan originally concocted by Churchill in May 1945, uh, high-ranking militaries uh, then uh, compiled it or uh, elaborated uh, on it. Uh, the plan by Churchill was the new shape of Poland with the, the right-leaning Polish exiles in Great uh, That was very well represented in Great Britain, this right-leaning 
uh, ex-emigres uh, should return to Poland, they should run as candidates in the next round of elections. They would then become a anti-communist bulwark uh, inside the Soviet bloc. It was a delusion. Churchill became quite angry about this failure. Then he had the military develop new plans, uh, pr envisaging British and the US American units working together to make an assault uh, into the late, what was, was to become the GDR to, to fight back against the Soviet forces. And the kickback was Churchill, it was clear that his own forces were not enough. Well, take the Wehrmacht, the ex-Wehrmacht soldiers. Why don't you use them? They would be reused against the Soviet Union. That was Churchill's idea. There was a very hefty resistance against this in the military. Churchill lost the elections, and the Labour government under Attlee buried this plan and dismissed it altogether. So. Uh, this operation unthinkable was never carried through, but it was one of the envisaged uh, options that the Brits uh, kept open. To understand this better, you need to get a clear picture. The British-Soviet cooperation in the anti-Hitler coalition, as well as the brief cooperation in World War I, these are, so to speak, mishaps during the history of the wars. Uh, Great Britain and Russia and the Soviet Union have always been sworn in with, in the 19th century when Great Britain was uh, the dominating world power. Russia became stronger. There were clashes between the uh, United Kingdom and the aspiring Russian Empire, the Crimean War, and also several other clashes. Even uh, during World War I, in the first period, British soldiers, uh, after the dictator of Brest-Litovsk, uh, attacked certain spots in Russia to prevent the Germans from advancing. It's little is known about this in Germany, but for example, British troops uh, were deployed in the south of Russia to fight back uh, German troops against breaking through to the Caucasus. And uh, British troops uh, remained there, and uh, the war minister was Winston Churchill. And Churchill said, once they uh, are deployed, they should also support the White Guard uh, in their fight against the Red Army. So uh, there was a British intervention immediately after World War I against the Soviets. And the idea was to repeat this after World War II in a different geographical setting. This can be understood from the British perspective. The reactionary part of British elites is not so outlandish. That was certainly a possible option. And I think the utterly aggressive polit politics of the British uh, nowadays against Russia, these are traditional lines which in this operation unthinkable uh, just uh, popped up, were not realized, but which are still uh, alive. Thank you, Jörg. So we have nearly an unbroken line uh, from the past to the present in terms of the strategies of imperialism. Arnold, you wrote about the German Empire and the politics in Ukraine and also the use of uh, right-wing forces for imperial purposes. There also we have continuities. Maybe you can uh, shed a light from this perspective on the current uh, processes. How is the connect where are the connections of the historical fomenting of uh, reactionary forces and the fomenting uh, division uh, di dividing uh, tendencies and now the friendly attitude to fascist groups like Azov and others. Well, Olaf Scholz doesn't want to be, become a world power, I think, tomorrow. <laughs> but in the long run, I believe him and those who have to say something that they have uh, quite high ambitions in this direction. According to my opinion, even other imperial countries are subestimating this maybe. Of course, the situation for the German imperialism in 1945 uh, has uh, changed fundamentally. 
I mean, it was twice the, to get the grip on world power in 1914 and 1939. And uh, par uh, things like this uh, dismantling of the Russian Empire of the Soviet Union were part of this, of course. This was an integral part of the story. So that an American foreign minister 1919, in the negotiations in Versailles, said, Ukraine, Ukraine, that's an invention of the German uh, general uh, staff. Of course, that's ex exaggerated of too, but still, this is ideas behind there. Germans did a lot in order to uh, dismantle the Russian Empire in general, in its whole. And after 1945, though, this has changed. But um, in the long-term strategies of imperialism against the Soviet Union, and uh, now we again notice uh, on an everyday basis also against the Russian Federation, which is a capitalist state, this all has not changed. And uh, this is a story part, of course. So Operation Unthinkable, Jörg uh, iterated on that already quite a bit. What I thought was phenomenal during studying these things is when the German imperialism was really down, how seamless not only US and the UK um, stepped in on this function that Russia has to be dismantled, needs to be colonized. I mean, this is the idea behind, after all. And uh, so how, how quick they jumped in and uh, didn't have any problems, for example, to, um, to recruit the Ukrainian fascists. This happened in summer of 45 already. Bandera turned up in Munich with a lot of money, with uh, false papers, with a huge flat, with up to nine bodyguards have been counted. And all this under the protection of the Americans and the, and the Brits which were a bit more distance to him, of course, and after all with the German Secret Service, the Bundesnachrichtendienst. And the Americans had also this department of, uh, um, uh, the department was active in the East, in the uh, Soviet Union. They took the Reinhard Gillen, the general Reinhard Gillen, they took over from the, from the Germans and his team, and probably not many people know that, that even 1945, 46, 47, the agents of Galen, the contact persons who went to talk to the collaborators in Soviet Union, in the Baltic Republics, but especially also in Ukraine, they, they had kept contacts with them with their hands full of dollar bills and uh, with wrong papers and all that and still helped them and supported them. And the fights of the, of the UPA uh, under the direction of Shushkevich, this uh, friend of Bandera, until the beginning of the 1950s, especially in the, Carp in the Carpathians, mm -hmm. These struggles were barbarian. This wouldn't have never man managed to do so without money, without weapons from the West. So this seamlessly just continued. This is one thing what uh, we have to keep in mind, that there was no rupture at all. And the other thing is a story which, uh, um, which caught my attention uh, with the Bandera thing. The OUN was um, very smart in, I mean, the German, Mar German Nazis also learned that quite, quite fast. They learned, OK, we cannot, we cannot act against the Jews anymore, at least not officially. Uh, we're, uh, we're all Democrats now. And in 1943, they de have decided that before they, together with the Germans, fought against the advance of the Red Army. 
but they decided that they will lose the war, so we have to focus on the democracies and the stories, and accordingly they uh, falsified their documents in an organized manner, and that, well, that's what they did. But what remained is a way of, let's say, of anti-Soviet, anti-Russian fanatism, how it was directly how it directly came out of fascism, and it found this continuity in the nuclear times. Everybody knew the next war when it will start after dropping the bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. This next war will, latest 1949, this will be an atomic war from both sides. At least there were the plans, we know them, also the plans of the US, the whole problematic about Soviet Union, uh, to destroy Soviet Union, uh, still in the 1940s. And, um, and Bandera and his guys, he belonged to the people who didn't only say, well, the war against Russia is unavoidable and also a nuclear war is unavoidable, but, but it doesn't matter because that's all written in his texts and uh, that's all included in his texts and his protectors and his guardians all accepted that. And that is something, and if you read that today, I mean, that you get really cold shivers on your back. If you think on these lines of traditions which the current fascists in Ukraine uh, refer to, they really approach this question in the sense of, okay, Russia has to be d destroyed, even the world will end or whatever. I won't, not everybody, but this is the core point where they where they want to head to, and uh, where they can find uh, sympathy among the like-minded in the U.S. and in the West. And this is, to my understanding, a really terrible thing, which leads again and again to the situation that even here in the Federal Republic over the last years, and uh, even stronger under Trump, and uh, if him or a similar figure will be elect elected next year, oh, we cannot rely on the Americans anymore, we need the German bomb. Um, I mean, this debate is already uh, existing, and this pops up every now and then. Just need to have a look on these uh, gentlemen of the uh, of the Federal Academy of for Security Policy in Berlin Pankow, and other stories and other structures. That's already on the course, and um, I would say. Um, World power is not around the corner. Mr. Scholz and Ms. Baerbock need to work quite hard a bit on that. <coughs> but the problem from my point of view is if you wonder when did the real crumbling of the predominance position of the USA started. Some say this is not true, but I would say, let's see the economic crisis, which uh, was after the, uh, after the, uh, after the uh, real estate crisis 2008, uh, which was never really overcome. And Angela Merkel sa uh, said that at the time, we have to be stronger after this crisis. So, and she managed economically. Germany is much more advanced to the other powers in Western Europe, on the, like France and Great Britain, uh, than before the crisis. Mm. But this is, was the situation when the US really had a glimpse into the abyss where the decision came, um, Russia needs to be defeated. Yeah, Russia needs to be defeated. This is, this decision came at some point and this is 
part of the strategy for stabilization and of regaining the absolute dominance in the world. Uh, and, uh, and Germany is submitting unconditionally to that. Mm -hmm. And this is currently the situation, to my understanding. I just want to have a connection question to you on this development and what you just described. This goes hand in hand with uh, changings in the um, in the uh, superstructure. It says uh, Putin propaganda. Uh, not, there are no Nazis. Uh, and um, discussed together with the critique of the media, how they really managed to um, just hush up all these excesses, these these uh, the exaggerations, this uh, up to resolutions in European Parliament where um, it this is tried to, where they tried to turn this into a uh, raison d'état. Well. Um, I mean, we know, they know Holodomor is not just an invention of the UN, because uh, through the series uh, Holocaust, uh, uh, people became aware that the, the Jewish are the victims. No, it's us. And then in the 1980s, uh, this was invented. And um, now the German parliament comes to say this had been a genocide. I mean, they just rewrite history mm -hmm. and um, so to say this is really the highest the highest insets of appeal European Parliament did that even before so just a bit before I was talking with a participant here with a colleague from here with a comrade from here and we came to talk about this point how does it work and how um, does it work that well since 2014? And uh, well, we can give certain arguments. The often mentioned war of 2014. I mean, this massacre in Odessa, which was the beginning, this was a fascist massacre. And uh, this was an action how, just uh, as what the Nazis did at the beginning of their dominion where they show to the population if you just dare to do one more point then we will just uh, kill you and you will get burned and that's it very simple this was odessa 2nd may of 2014 and this is silenced this war in german media didn't take place everything was happened afterwards that there were that the, the, the ukraine uh, eastern ukraine was bombarded by ukraine I remember I was sitting in the in the editor's office one uh, Sunday, beginning of June 2014, and even DPA, German press agency, uh, was giving the news uh, Ukrainians were bombarding Lugansk. And then, okay, I'll put it into the newspaper, don't know. And then next day, in no other German newspaper, this DPA news had been reported. This is what it was. On the Friday of the same week, I mean, I checked it, the, the Frankfurt uh, Allgemeine Zeitung, in a long article at the end, uh, they mentioned allegedly in Lugansk there was a bombarding by Ukraine, and this was the way it was in the media. We had the book of Ulrich Haydn, the longest war in Europe since 1945. This was this 2014 to 2022, about nobody was writing here. This is how you do it. But this is just one example, I think. Uh, mm -hmm. The decisive or the important point is, and uh, that is a problem for us as a left-wing newspaper, as a, a newspaper which understands itself as um, as um, as uh, well progressive and we understand that certain facts have to be known and in this great educational system in the Fair Republic of Germany they don't exist anymore people are not informed anymore that Munich was such a center of Ukrainian fascists my father still told me this he knew about that 
But um, nowadays, nobody knows anymore if you, they don't learn in school, except the, the, not even talking about other things. Nobody will know. And often in, the, in, our, in our editor's group, we discussed often that we are facing an, an uh, more and more illiterate more illiterate uh, population, even r reading and writing for 30 million people here is a problem in Germany, uh, according to the figures. But even with people who historically um, and, uh, and even literature history and arts history, people don't have a clue anymore. It's kind of an alphabetism. And if we lose that, then we come to what every, uh, somewhere else is already called uh, the barbarisms and then you can just tell people whatever you want. That's the basic problem, I think. Okay, thank you, Arnold. Very yes. Ras Balant, you wrote a book about the Ukraine in 2014, about the fascist coup and the fruits these activities uh, of these fascist activities finally brought in, mm -hmm. how this was retranslated really into concrete politics in this coup d'etat. Mm -hmm. So uh, um, mm -hmm. the illiteration of the big masses in the US, how this, what, was the, what was an impact on the US of the putsch of 2014? Yeah. Oh, and the okay. role of the German government. <laughs> um, well, I didn't do a book on it. I was doing reports as things, as events were unfolding because every th things were moving so fast in Ukraine from the, uh, uh, the coup, Odessa, and so forth. Uh, but um, I also want to make a historical note on, on this discussion. Uh, in addition to the British interventions, uh, a lot of people don't know that um, the United States did two military interventions against the USSR in, tw in 1919. One, one th on your... Murmansk and one from the Pacific Coast. Uh, there's still a monument in uh, a Michigan cemetery for the Michigan soldiers who invaded Murmansk in 1919. Uh, and uh, it didn't last long. Um, they thought it was going to be quick and easy and uh, they couldn't take the weather. They put, the Americans didn't stay that long. Uh, I think less than a year. I'm sorry, I don't recall precisely how long they were there. But I wanted to make sure that that note of working in concert with uh, the British Empire at that time, uh, uh, they were there even that early in the war. Uh, but back to uh, 2014. Um, uh, it, it, wow, so much. The coup uh, in, in uh, 2014 was, uh, of course, prompted by... Uh, it was implement, being implemented by the State Department, uh, senior leadership of the State Department in concert with the CIA, which had expanded its embassy in great numbers. Uh, I was talking to somebody earlier about this. They, they put signs on the, the CIA building in English because there were so many that didn't know Ukraine. The only way they could find their location was to, for the, it became uh, an English uh, village, if you will. Uh, the growth of American personnel in 2014. And the, uh, uh, the coup was uh, uh, precipitated by uh, snipers that most of, the, most of the evidence points to that being uh, snipers un under the uh, Banderas employed through a CIA strategy. Uh, the, uh, when the uh, uh, elected uh, president of the Ukraine decided he would make a financial deal with Russia because the European Union didn't offer him a raw deal compared to what Russia offered. Uh, uh, president Obama said, you're not going to sign that deal. He ordered him not to. He said, I'm, I'm the elected president of Ukraine. You're not going to tell me how to run my country. Um, Joe Biden was the political officer over all the covert operations, the entire regime change uh, at that time. So, so his, real, his election in 2020 promised a continuation of what he did when he was uh, vice president. Uh, and at, at that time, uh, they, uh, 
uh, the Maidan Square. E even the New York Times reported in December of 2013 that the street muscle, and that's their term, the street muscle of Maidan Square were, were the uh, uh, Ukrainian nationalist Nazis. They used the term back then. After they used it once, however, they didn't ever use it again. They started referring to the Nazi battalions as volunteer battalions. And, and uh, so uh, the, U the U.S. government got the New York Times straight on the correct messaging uh, at that time. But they, uh, uh, when they uh, organized the coup, uh, the peoples in Luhansk and Donetsk and so forth said they wanted more autonomy. They didn't want to separate and create separate republics, but they wanted more autonomy, the way states in the United States have autonomy within the federal system. And uh, they, they, were, they saw who was being put in positions of leadership. They recognized that, you know, the uh, uh, Azov Battalion was formed and they were wearing uh, the 2nd Panzer Division insignia, which was, uh, which every Russian understood the meaning of. Uh, and so, the, uh, that polarized the situation further. And then, uh, of course, the day after the coup, the... Uh, nach, am Tag nach diesem Putsch? Hmm? Oh, I, I, I didn't... Oh, okay, I heard a voice in my... Okay. Um, the... Um, uh, <laughs> it's okay, somebody was having a side conversation somewhere. The... Um, the... Uh, new regime, the appointed regime, uh, and Victoria Newland from the U.S. State Department, Assistant Secretary of State, was the one who actually picked the officers and who was going to be the new leadership. And then she sent the list around to NATO to get their sign off on it. And, uh, and then they put them in place. This was all obvious to the people of Eastern Ukraine. And uh, the from the character of Maidan to the people who, uh, the Banderas who are being appointed to high positions in the interior ministry and in the military and uh, 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 d departments and so forth. And so they uh, accelerated their demands and um, in the war, the, the response uh, uh, was a military response, as you know, and uh, the United Nations would es estimated that by by the uh, by 2022, uh, 15,000 people died <clears throat> in Eastern Ukraine, um, and in the end of 2014, uh, uh, Poroshenko gave a talk on how they were going to win the war in the East. And he said, we are going to make it so that nobody will be alive unless they live in their basements. And that's, that was everything that was done, every step of the way was coordinated with the U.S. Embassy. To, uh, and the United States was in complete lockstep with that invasion and that massive assault, which got very little press coverage. And when it was covered, it was covered as a civil war, not a massive onslaught from the Kiev regime to kill the people in the east. And uh, so, um, as you know, the European Union, I think primarily led by Germany and France, uh, was monitoring the violence of that period of time and set up listening posts and were monitoring all the shellings and the bombings and the ex explosions that they were detecting on their uh, systems. And uh, there were periods where it went down when Kiev signed agreements and the Minsk agreements and so forth and other ac Minsk accords, uh, three treaties to stop the killing. And uh, those were never honored by the Kiev side. And so the, uh, the fourth, fourth, round of escalation was February 16th of 2022. The, the, the European Union picked up 
all the, the renewal of the aerial bombardment and the uh, and the uh, artillery shelling of the eastern Ukraine again and what had changed a little bit from the previous periods of the war was that the U United States State Department and separately the US Department of Defense the military signed separate agreements with Kiev to for long-term strategic planning for building military capacity of Ukraine to go after territories that were uh, being held by quote Ukrainian uh, territories that were being held by Russia uh, one pact was signed I think in August of uh, 2021 and one was signed in November Russia responded uh, Sergei Lavrov gave a proposal to the United Nations and a proposal to the US US government to begin negotiations for a demilitarized zones in which Russia would pull back troops from the Ukrainian border and Ukraine would demilitarize and would not be part of NATO and Joe Biden said we're not having any such discussions we're not interested in those discussions of demilitarization of the region and so um, I'm not particularly a defender of every you know everything on uh, either side but at that point uh, there was a CIA senior head of the CIA's uh, analysis section of Russia said on Radio Free Europe he he was asked whether Russia is really a uh, under a threat because Russia was saying they were threatened by uh, the advance of NATO and so forth and of course there were big NATO buildups in Poland and the Baltic areas uh, Romania and so forth m underground missile silos probably nuclear missiles but I'm not certain of that but huge military buildup and so the CIA analyst was asked uh, about the claims the Russia of uh, Russia having a threat and this CIA head of analysis said actually the United States is building a naval port in Crimea and he said it is a threat to Russia he was retired he could say what he felt and it was and so at some point you know if you Russia has to say okay there's long there's military packs there with between Kiev in the United States to build the military capacity they've been killing thousands and thousands of Russian speaking people in the East now in with the Feb February 16th initiation of new round of massive uh, killing there there were huge migrations into safe zones inside Ru the Russian territory um, just north if I'm remembering right just north of uh, Ukraine and so you have to decide is are we going to invade now or wait till they invade us because that was what the threat was and it was open and even the CIA said so so what do you do Jörg, can we come back to the starting point, uh, the initial question, the Banderites and the fascists, are they warmongers for World War III? In England, they are keep telling us, uh, well, by sheer numbers, it's not so important. They are not mathematically not so important. Nonetheless, uh, looking at the peace process and peace negotiations, they seem to have a rather major role, an essential role. In Ukraine, it is a crime to, end, to make a plea for peace negotiations with Russia. How would, what's your take on this? Uh, we heard from Oleg Yasinski that they have an instrumental role to work on behalf of the ruling class. Do they have their own agenda? How would you describe this relationship with a 
look, look at the Ukrainian peace negotiation. It's a complex question. I would second uh, what uh, Moss uh, or uh, Russ said a while ago. Yes, they have a clear agenda to stay the rather rigorous course. Uh, the legislation in Ukraine supports this in so many respects. There is certainly so much to be expected. Question is, what comes next? What will be the military development? Uh, what is uh, the military development, not only in Ukraine itself, but also the framework conditions? What we are observing now is that the United States uh, and and it, at any rate, uh, the right-wing Republicans are exercising pressure on the government to, to, in order to reduce uh, the arms supplies to Ukraine, which will, have an, which will have an immediate effect on the warfare in Ukraine. Nobody can ignore this. The same is true for the ammunition supplies uh, now diverted to Israel rather than to Ukraine. The real situation will be of such a nature that the aggressive uh, policies without any regard uh, to the uh, demands for peace in Russia. Well, let's wait and see wh what the next uh, steps will be. The assessment that it, uh, I, similar to Moss, I would not say it's a fascist state, but they are on a path towards a fascist fascist state, depending on the surrounding conditions mm -hmm. and depending also on uh, the behavior and whether they want to initiate war against Russia. Well, it's certainly a difficult uh, question. Uh, any forecast is difficult, especially if you believe more or less the surveys, uh, huge parts of the Ukrainian population are uh, have been instigated to hatred they are outrageous about the war of course uh, they are outraged about uh, the war which is uh, certainly understandable so it's difficult to judge what uh, makes me concerned uh, well you mentioned this at the beginning uh, the mil the fighter from Taiwan. It's a mood that is not limited to Ukraine. It's a very uh, exciting case. Moss uh, has told us something about the Anti-Communist League. Uh, we are grateful to him. Uh, it has been forgotten, probably. The, it has renamed itself uh, for freedom and democracy, World League for free, but it was not established by the. No, no, by, it was set up by Chiang Kai shek and uh, by Taiwan. It was uh, expanded to a global uh, size in 1966. Then the European Bandera groups uh, joined uh, this new organization. They are fighting today side by side, well, uh, for freedom and uh, freedom and peace, or for today uh, for peace and democracy. The big question arises: uh, Shouldn't we expand our view, Arnold? Uh, do we have anything like an international of fascists that group around certain political conflicts, uh, uh, po geopolitical uh, conf hotspots? Well, I do not observe this. I'm not knowledgeable about this. Every now and then, you, something is popping up in the media that uh, relevant uh, people or these guys have convened again here or there. Again, I would say I would second uh, the statements made by Jürgen Lloyd a while ago. If there is a need for fascism, is uh, coming up in imperialism, then the risk is there. Such networks that may exist uh, and such connections that may exist uh, will turn out to be very useful. But my feeling is the decisive thing depends on this. 
again, I believe that uh, it, uh, the, uh, one of uh, the tilting points was the big economic crisis, the world economic crisis, and all the underneath developments, a permanent crisis that is lingering on since then. I follow the good Aledi Pandor, the foreign minister of South Africa, whose speech uh, has been published by our newspaper last week. She told us uh, that her impression is uh, that this is a setback, a kick back uh, a political decision, a consciously taken decision to prevent the further rise of the so-called emergent countries, the, the, the famous global south. South, it's not about socialism. It's uh, about preventing these countries uh, from becoming more autonomous. For the very first time, they claim to be on an equal footing and they want to be treated on a level playing field with China and India in the back. They want to take their opportunities. I found this uh, that rather exciting that Pandora stated this. Uh, well, this is just an attempt to stop this new rise of the Global South. They want to put a break on this. Well, this is the crucial thing to notice here. Mm -hmm. Of course, uh, uh, well, the, uh, these powers uh, to be are uh, eager to take fascists like in the Odessa just to send a message to the people in Odessa. Or as Jürgen Lloyd put it quite aptly, they believe uh, now we need to take strict measures, rigorous measures, otherwise we will not manage. So then they will fall back on such fascist troops. That would be my tentative answer. So finally, um, uh, Russ, uh, looking at the U.S. Arnold, touched upon this, the U.S. are uh, waning, this hegemonic model is uh, crumbling, new states are taking the foreground uh, for the domestic policy. We have uh, seen this attack on the capital, no, no, sorry, <laughs> the capital, not the capital. So, uh, so these are extreme right-wing forces. What's your take on this? Looking at the domestic policy in the U.S., these are fascists that have found themselves and assembled under Trump and have been promoted by Trump. And yes. What does it mean for the for the peace movement? Oh, boy, uh, it's a complicated picture because the Democratic Party is offering us a candidate of expanded war. Um, and uh, while it was said that Donald Trump was a friend of Putin, the fact of the matter is Donald Trump was e increasing the funding to Ukraine as well. <laughs> um, and so uh, what you get with Donald Trump is a de de more destabilization of the domestic political system. Uh, you get uh, the, the courts turned into a rubber stamp for the, the forces of deep reaction, the forces that want to uh, destroy even the modicum of a liberal state, uh, the uh, moneyed interest. Uh, there's a senator, a U.S. Senator Whitehouse from Rhode Island has been doing reports on the Senate floor about how hundreds of millions of dollars have been spent through uh, covert right-wing networks to re-engineer the American court system. You know, Benjamin Netanyahu probably learned from the United States how to re-engineer court systems. Eh? And um, this, will, th this is under a, a, under a temporary stop under the Biden administration. Uh, uh, they're appointing, you know, reasonable people to the courts. Um, but with Donald Trump, the court system will, he, he promises to accelerate faster uh, and destroy the capacity of anybody in opposition to him. From labor, labor law 
he's attacking the United Auto Workers in Detroit uh, over their strikes. Even though some of those auto workers were voting for him, I think he lost some of those votes because the United Auto Workers decided years, some years ago to elect the president instead of doing it at a convention through the membership. And as a result, we have a, a leadership that actually has a working class consciousness and has led fights that has been so powerful and his messaging has been so powerful and so straightforward about the rich exploitation of the working class of, of the United States that more and more strikes are happening now. We've got strikes going on in Detroit and Michigan that we never expected. <laughs> People are, everybody's getting the message. Donald Trump is threatening that kind of development. You know, Biden is saying, you know, he, he went to a picket line. Now, how, how deep is that commitment? Not very. But Donald Trump attacked the picket line. <laughs> okay. So we've got a warmongering, frankly, Joe Biden versus a Donald Trump who will destroy the court system and the domestic uh, uh, rights of the people and the economics of the people from Social Security and Medicare and the basics that support millions of people in, in their livelihood or in their retirement. So w we, we don't have good choices in this. And there's a third party guy who's r running now as an independent, Robert Kennedy, who's a, a very dangerous individual. His own family says so. We know so. And so, uh, you know, the Kennedy name uh, is going to carry some weight and will work probably to help elect Donald Trump president. If <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you, Ross Ballen. Thank you, Arnold Schulze. Thank you, Jörg Kunert. And thank you, Oleg Jasinski. Thank you all for participating here today, for being here. Thanks you for all your patience with us. This was a very insightful conference and probably it says something about the conditions we live in. It's uh, actually, it's a daily newspaper which uh, is organizing this uh, event here, which should actually also be organized by scientific institutions or whatever, but we did it and thank you for being with us. So we stick to this topic, don't worry, thank you so much.